Hey guys, my name is Radek. I'm your TA for Economics 1 B03. And this is chapter 4, so this is the last chapter that is going to be the same thing for 1 B03 and 1 BB3, the micro and macro. So let's get going here. So the term supply and demand refers to the behavior of people in a market. Supply and demand are driven by price, or we can say that they are dependent on price. Another way we can say this is, is supply and demand are the dependent variables and the price is an independent variable. Now, markets are where buyers and sellers interact. And in the real world, the majority of markets are perfectly competitive. Uh, so what does this mean? The term perfectly competitive means that there are numerous buyers and numerous sellers of a specific good. So we can call this perfect competition. Other markets which can be ex which will be explored uh, will be duopolies, monopolies, and oligopolies, but we don't have to really worry about this right now. For the time being, we will focus on perfectly competitive markets. So this means that the price is determined by all buyers and sellers in an economy. So let me explain why buyers and sellers determine price. Suppose you have two pizza places on the same street. Each pizza place makes their pizzas equally as well, so they're perfectly they're perfect substitutes. Now suppose that one pizzeria raises their price from $10 to $15 while the other one keeps it at 10 The pizzeria with the lower price of pizza will get all the customers at this point. Now suppose that one pizza place lowers their price from $10 to $8 and the other one keeps their price at $10. The pizza place that charges $8 for their pizza will now get all the customers and all the business. So what if the pizza places start to undercut one another? Suppose that the price is $10 and one cuts it to $8. Then the other responds with a price of $7, which the other one responds to a price of $6 and so forth. Uh, will they keep undercutting one another until the price is zero? Um, now remember that economic and accounting profits are different. Um, at the point where economic profit is zero, firms will choose to exit the market. If there is no profit to be had, they will explore other options. Now, yet again, be aware that accounting and economic profits are two very different things. Economic profit takes into account opportunity cost, and opportunity cost is the cost of the next best foregone alternative. And we've explored opportunity costs already, so you should be familiar with what an opportunity cost is and why it's so different. So let us look at the demand and supply curves. Uh, the demand curve has a negative slope because of, the, because of the relationship as price increases, quantity demanded drops. The supply curve has a positive slope because the relationship as price increases, suppliers want to supply more of that good. So what changes? So what changes at a point? Um, so what changes a point on the demand curve? Well, any changes in the price will be a shift along the demand curve. This is important, but the demand curve can also shift in and out, right? It can move towards the origin or it can move away from the origin. So what will shift the demand curve? Well, these are called determinants of demand and they are the changes in, of income, price of related goods, tastes, expectations, and number of buyers. These are the five determinants that will shift a demand curve. Um, we'll come back to this in a moment. Now first let's deviate and talk about goods. Well, we have four basic kinds of goods. We have normal goods, inferior goods, complement goods, and substitute goods. A normal good, for example, is a Ferrari. An inferior good is um, a 1998 Chrysler 300M, like a piece of crap car. Um, and a substitute good would be, let's say, a Lamborghini to a Ferrari, right? A Lamborghini is really awesome. Ferrari is really awesome. Um, if you can't buy a Ferrari, you'll buy a Lamborghini. They're substitutes. They're both normal goods. Now, the Lambo and Ferrari are both normal goods, but trading one for the other doesn't make one better than the other or one less good than the other. A complement good would be kind of like um, a lighter to a cigarette or cream to a coffee or shoes to a nice dress. So say you are driving a Chrysler 300M and your income increases to 200000 a year. Now you can buy a Ferrari, let's say. Or suppose that you are, have, you are living in a bachelor apartment and you will be starting a new job that pays 200000 a year, so you can buy a house. So this is an example of changing expectations. So when your income or expectations change for the better, the demand curve for inferior goods 
will shift towards the origin and the demand curve for normal goods will shift out and away from the origin. So these are two different goods and two different demand curves. So when your income increases or your expectations that your income is going to increase, you will be buying better stuff. So instead of KD, you'll be buying steak. Instead of Chrysler's, you'll be buying Ferraris. Instead of living in an apartment, you'll be buying a house. Now the opposite can also happen, right? You can be expecting that you will be fired hypothetically, or you can be expecting that there's a recession coming along so you won't be making as much. So you'll be shifting away from these luxury goods to more inferior goods. The other way we can look at it is normal goods are perceived as luxuries and inferior goods are usually necessities. Necessities such as one-ply toilet paper, right, instead of the quilted bounty brand, so forth. So let's use KD as an example. It is an inferior good, and I don't care what anybody says, it's an inferior good. So suppose your income increases, or you're expecting to get a greater job, or a better job, um, after graduation. You will buy less KD and more steak. And I don't care that the song goes that if I had a million dollars, I'd buy Kraft Dinner, just more Kraft Dinner. No, you wouldn't. You'd be buying more steak and less Kraft Dinner. So the demand curve for Kraft Dinner shifts left. It shifts in towards the origin, and the curve for steak will shift out and to the right. Now remember, the demand curve for KD and the demand curve for steak are two different demand curves and they will not be on the same X and Y axes. Now suppose that the price of KD changes and you are still poor. You will now be able to buy more KD, but nothing will change with the demand curve. It will not shift. As a general rule of thumb, the demand curve shifts in for inferior goods as income rises and it shifts out for normal goods as income rises. A tricky example would be if you are already rich, buying steak, and you start making even more money. Well, steak is already a normal good, it is already a luxury, and so now you can buy more of it. In relative terms, the steak has become cheaper and now you can buy more of it. But this is kind of the thing that you will not come across on a test, I don't believe. Um, it's just kind of cool to think about in relative terms. So let's move on to the supply curve. As the price of a good increases, the supplier wants to provide more of it because he or she is making a larger profit on the good. Um, so a change in the price is a movement along the supply curve yet again. So what will shift the supply curve? There are four things that will shift the supply curve. A change in price of input goods, a change in technology, a change in expectations, or a change in the number of firms. So let's go th through a few of these. So a change in... change in... A change in price of input goods. What are input goods? It is the stuff that is required to make that good. So say you are making shoes. You need rubber, you need fabric, you need shoelaces. Let's say those are the three things that you need. If the rubber becomes cheaper, if the shoelaces become cheaper, if the fabric becomes cheaper, the supplier will be making a larger profit. So the, the, the supply curve will shift right. He can supply more of it. A change in technology, so say that the process of making shoes becomes cheaper, you all of a sudden move your factories out to China where you can pay the people a few cents a day, well, the, well technically the technology is not changing, so let's say that a new sewing machine comes out, right, and now you can sew a lot quicker and it's a lot cheaper, right, so the technology has changed. A uh, change in expectation, so if you are expecting um, rubber to become more expensive because crude oil is going up in price, well then your supply curve will shift left. It will shift left. Um, a, ch a change in the number of firms. So if you are making an economic profit, that is an incentive for firms to come in. So if there's more firms coming in, the supply curve is going to be shifting out because more firms are supplying more of the good. So the supply curve moving to the left is a decrease in supply and a shift to the right is an increase in supply. So now let's talk about equilibrium. Simply, this is a point where the supply and demand curve meet. This point gives us the optimal price and optimal quantity. And these values are equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. So what happens if the price is not at equilibrium price? This depends on if it's above or below the equilibrium. If the price of a good or service is too high, then we will be in a surplus of the good, and if it's too low, we, there will become a shortage. For example, let's take gas as, as, as the example. 
if the price of the pump is too high, no one is going to buy gas and we will have an excess supply of gas. But if the price is too low, then everyone will go out, fill up, and we will have a shortage. If the price is too high, then suppliers will want to move their product and start to lower the price. If the price is too low, they will figure out that they can charge more for a good and end up charging a higher price. Now in the long run, the price will stabilize in equilibrium, ceteris paribus, and we will be at long run equilibrium. Ceteris paribus means all other things remaining the same. So that is all for chapter four. In the next chapter, we will not be working on the macro book anymore. We'll be moving on to elasticities and we'll be seeing um, how equilibrium and price sensitivity will affect shortages and surpluses.